Hi everyone, I'm Joe Brady and today we're going to explore how to set up and use the Sekonic 758 meter for capturing high dynamic scenes with a single exposure. Now while HDR or high dynamic range compositing of multiple exposures can be a great tool, it can also be both very time consuming and it's frequently unnecessary. When I'm out in the field teaching a workshop, I often see and hear those around me shooting three and five and even seven bracketed exposures for every scene we photograph. What I'm able to prove to them is that in the vast majority of cases, HDR bracketing is unnecessary. And at the end of the day, I have three to five times fewer images to sort through and edit. I'm a big fan of getting it right in camera and capturing the best digital file possible. This saves me many hours of editing and compositing time in front of the computer. Now, while it's true that I still process my images, what remains for me to do is to adjust and enhance the contrast and color of my images rather than trying to fix problems and combine multiple exposures to get one good shot. When you capture the best file possible, and by this I mean taking advantage of the dynamic range your camera has to offer, you'll find that one shot will frequently be all you need. By the way, when you take this shot, it may look awful on the back of your camera, but we'll see why that's the case later on. But if you trust the tools we're going to use, you can leave a location knowing that you have great images that just need a bit of shaping to make them into incredible photographs. So let's stop guessing and let's stop wasting time with a shotgun approach by taking hundreds of images of the same scene when maybe one tenth might do. While landscape photography is frequently a very relaxing activity, it can also at times be frustrating. You sit and wait for that perfect light and shadow and then the perfect conditions happen only to disappear after a short moment. By knowing what your camera can do and by being prepared for that perfect moment, you won't miss that shot you've been waiting for. So here's how we'll proceed. First, I'm going to introduce the tools we'll use. This will include the Sekonic L758DR light meter and an X-Rite color checker passport. We're going to create a custom exposure profile for our camera using Sekonic's free DTS software. We're going to put that information into use out in the field and see how this combination of tools gives you all the information you need for that perfect single exposure. Then we'll go back into the studio and take a look at our preliminary results. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the files might at first glance look terrible, but then I'm going to show you some quick techniques to shape these digital files into beautiful photographs. This will show you that all the data you need is there, it just needs some shaping and enhancements. So this might bring up the question as to why this is all necessary. Well, the bottom line is that when presented with a high contrast scene, cameras don't see the way our eyes do. Our eyes are constantly doing HDR sampling and can see much more tonal range than our cameras. They adjust contrast and color as needed while our cameras are limited to one white balance setting and one contrast curve. In high contrast scenes, even like the one I'm standing in right now, there are many different areas of contrast and several color temperatures going on at the same time. Now while today's cameras do a fantastic job with normally lit scenes, when presented with bright sunlit clouds and a blue sky, or bright fog or snow, along with deep shadows, maybe in a canyon, they just don't know what to do. Since it's you, the photographer, that ends up making those decisions, you need to know how to override the camera and take control. So let's take a look at the gear and get everything set up for our outdoor shots. So since it's cold outside, I decided to come up into my office first before going outside because I want to have everything set up before I have to go out into the cold. The first thing we need to do is to calibrate the 758 meters two sensors and then take shots of our color checker passport, which I have right here with our camera. We start by taking both incident and reflective readings of the scene. Now before you do this, make sure that your meter is set to measure in full and tenths of a stop. You set the meter in tenths of a stop by going to the custom function. So to do that, I need to power off, and then I need to hold in the mode button and then power on. So if I hold in mode and power on, you'll see you get a different readout and it says CS in the upper right hand corner, and I have 011. Now what you want to do is spin the jog wheel until you see 03. Do that counterclockwise. So there's two and then three. Now what you want is for it to show 030. Here you see 031, which is the meter set to thirds of a stop. If it's showing another number other than zero, tap the mode button here as it cycles through the choices. So you can see there's two and there's zero. That's what we want, 030. That will set the meter to tenths of a stop. I then power off, 
power it back on. And now it's reading in tenths of a stop. So I have to actually take a measurement here. You'll see I get a number and it says in this case at eighth of a second, 28.9, which is 289 tenths of a stop. And now our meter is set in tenths. Before we go outside, let's just uh, go over the, the basics of what we're going to do when we get out there. Since it's nice and quiet and warm here in my uh, office, we're going to take an incident reading and a reflective reading using the color checker passport. We're going to remember or write down the values, including that tenths reading. So you're going to just take a reading right here, right in front of the passport using incident. Remember those numbers or write them down. Then we're going to take a spot reading off of the fourth patch in. So starting from the white, we're going to come in four. This gray here is actually an 18% gray, or 18% reflectance gray, uh, which is what we're going to use to calibrate. To do that, we have to take a spot reading. Now when we take a spot reading, we simply rotate the eyepiece until we see the blue icon on here. And we're going to look through the eyepiece until we see that gray. And we're going to take a reading off of it. Now when you do this, do make sure that you're not doing anything to cast any kind of shadow on this gray. I'm going to put this on a, on a flat surface so that I can do that. So we're going to take a spot reading off of that, and we're going to write those numbers down as well. Now you can expect these numbers to be different because the meter actually has two separate sensors, one for the incident reading and one for the spot reading. Then we're going to take three exposures of the target with our camera. We're going to start by taking a middle exposure using the same numbers we got when we took that incident reading with the meter. Then you're going to take one exposure, three stops open, and one three stops closed from that initial reading. Now the easiest way to do this is by simply adjusting your shutter speed. So for example, if we start with 125th of a second for the middle exposure, three stops open, or if you like to count clicks, it'd be nine clicks on your shutter dial, will be 1 15th of a second, and then three stops closed will be 1 1,000th of a second. Once we get those shots done, we'll have everything we need to set up the meter for the camera. So, no longer uh, putting it off, I guess we're going to have to go out in the cold and get these shots done. So, let's head out back. Alright, so I've come out in the cold to get our actual shots in our reading. So, let's get that done so we can get inside. Because there's actually snow, I don't know if you can see the snow off in the distance and it's flurrying right now. So, as I mentioned, we're going to take an incident reading in front of the color checker passport. We're going to remember those values or write them down. Then we're going to take a spot reading off of the gray patch. All right, so let's get our readings. I'm at 100 ISO. I'm using a 60th of a second. I am on a tripod with my camera. It's really handy because we're going to be adjusting the shutter speed a lot. I don't make the images line up later on in the software better. You'll see that when we get to that point. So incident reading. I'm going to come over here, point right back to the camera. And you can see I've got 60th of a second at 4.2, f4.2. Great, we'll write that one down. Then I'm going to spin the eyepiece dial to the spot meter function and I'll take a reading the fourth patch in. I'll take my spot reading and I get a 60th of a second at f4 and 7 tenths, so you can see. So, might sound like a lot, it really isn't. It's only five, it's actually half a stop, it's five tenths. So half a stop difference between what the incident meter is seeing and the reflective meter. Not uncommon because there are two different sensors in here. When we run those numbers through the software, what it's going to do is it's going to calibrate the two of them together so that this thing is going to see light the way that the camera does. So now we've got our readings. We can put this away for a bit because we do know what our incident reading was. It was 60th of a second at f4 and 2 tenths. We're going to put those numbers in the camera and we're going to take three shots. Again, I'm using 100 ISO. We're going to be at a 60th of a second. I need to open up three stops from that. So we can do nine clicks or just half it three times. 60th, 30th, 15th, 8th. So we're going to be at an eighth of a second is going to open up three stops. Then we'll close down three stops. 125, 250, 500. So it'll be 500th of a second. So let's go to those three shots. And we're then going to have everything we need to create the custom exposure calibration for our camera. So remember, your camera doesn't do tenths of a stop, so I'm at f4 to 60th of a second at 100 ISO. So I'm going to get my first shot. There's my middle exposure. Now I'm going to open up three stops. And remember, we figured out what that was. Either nine clicks or one eighth of a second, as we figured out. So we take that shot. There's our eighth of a second, and that's going to be three stops overexposed. And now we're going to go down to one five hundredth of a second. 
which will be three stops closed. And there we go. So by doing that, we've got the three shots that we need to test the tonal range of the sensor. And the software is gonna figure that out based on where the clipping happens, both in the highlights and the shadows. So as a landscape photographer, I'm always shooting at the lowest ISO possible. So I am shooting at 100 ISO here. If you're interested or curious, you can create exposure profiles for different ISOs. As you go up to a very high ISO, 3200, 6400 ISO, you might see that your camera's dynamic range is starting to shrink a little bit, and you can create a profile for that as well. But we have everything we need for our landscape shoot, so let's take the card and the camera and the gear and get back inside, because it's cold out here. So I've come back into my office. I've got the three images loaded into my software. In this case, I just loaded them into Lightroom. Now, these are, I shot raw files. You can shoot JPEGs, but I prefer the control of raw. I shot a RAW, but I'm now going to have to export three JPEGs because that's what the software is expecting. As you can see here, I've got my perfect exposure. I've got three stops overexposed, and then I've got three stops underexposed. And this is all I need. Now, it's also a good idea to have the correct white balance set. So if you did not, like if you had something really weird and your screen looked kind of like that, white balance the image first, and I'll just come over here. To, I'm going to actually use the white patch on the far corner. White balance off of that. Select all the images, click on sync, and what I want is the white balance. I can choose the camera calibration as well. Now they are all synced and ready to be exported. I'll export these three JPEGs, then we can bring them into the software and create the custom exposure profile. When this process is complete, the meter is gonna know exactly how your camera measures and sees light, and every camera is different. It's gonna know the dynamic range of this sensor and it's gonna know exactly what this camera thinks a middle exposure is. Now, you would think there'd be standards for this, but unfortunately, every camera's all over the place. Every camera company has a different idea as to what color is and to what exposure is. This way, when we're done and ready to use the meter in the field, it's gonna show us the information we've loaded into it to show what the perfect exposure and the dynamic range for this camera is. So, let's go ahead and create the custom profile, custom exposure profile for the meter, and then we'll load it into the meter. So I've got my three images ready to send out to the uh, Sconic DTS software, but first I'm just gonna go ahead and make it a little easier. I am gonna crop these ahead of time. I don't need the top target. The only one we're interested in is right here. And we don't need the full resolution of the file either because it's looking at exposure, not resolution. So that's better. Now I'm gonna select all three images. I'm going to click on sync and what I want to add is the crop. So now they're all cropped exactly the same and you'll see why this is handy when we get into software. So let's go ahead and export these files. I'm going to export them. First I'm going to tell them where I want them to go. I'm going to put them in the folder that I'm using for the DTS shots and there it is. So we'll put them there. I'm not going to rename them. I am going to resize them though. I'm going to use a full quality JPEG, but there's no reason for them to be 42 megapixels. So 2000 pixels I'm going to use. Click on export and that's going to send those three files out so that we can then put them into the DTS software. In order to load the custom exposure profile into the meter, I am going to connect the meter to the computer. Now you don't need to do it in any particular order. You can create your exposure profiles first and then plug in your meter and download it. But just wanted you to see on the side of the meter is a little door. It's got a mini USB plug here. So I'm just going to go ahead and plug that in and power on the meter. This way when we start the DTS software, it will see that the meter is there. And then when we're done creating our exposure profile, we can download it right into the meter. So here's the uh, DTS software. And what we're going to do is create a new profile. So we click on that and we just need quick mode. Click there and it asks us which target are you using? We're using the color checker passport target. And here's where we need to put in the values we measured for our incident on our reflected reading. If you remember, we were at a 60th of a second, F4 and 2 tenths for our incident reading, 60th of a second, F4, 7 tenths for our reflected reading. This will allow the two sensors in the meter to be calibrated when we create this custom exposure profile. Then we need to tell it, well, where are the shots that you took? Where are those three exposures? So we navigate over to the folder where you put them. 
In this case, there's the raw files plus the JPEGs. Software is only going to see the JPEGs. You need to tell it, well, here's the JPEGs I want to use. Click on the box and it puts kind of a uh, light green arrow in that upper corner. Then we click on next and it's going to ask us, well, in, I need to know where the target is. So you click on one of the images and it makes it full screen and you need to drag the little crosshairs it gives you into the corners of the target. And there are four of them. The order that you do it really doesn't matter. And here's the advantage that we gained by having this on a tripod because we just get to click on the other images and it places the crosshairs in exactly the same spot. So now you click on next and here's where the fun happens. And here's the initial profile that is created using these targets. Now this is very conservative, that's why I say initial, but we do get a sense to see the exact tonal range that the software is seeing with these conservative settings. You can see it's saying we've got three and a half uh, stops up and 3.3 stops down. Let's go ahead and save this first. I'll call it uh, Sony A7R2 100 ISO. Oop, actually that I typed in A7 IV. Let's make that an R, save that. And now what we're gonna do is we're going to go back and edit that profile. We wanna bring it back up because we wanna give the camera its due and actually use the exposure range that it's capable of. So click on edit profile, change exposure range. Then go get the profile and you have to tell it again what ISO you used. And here's our profile. So you see the dynamic range, it's set for 245. Well, if you remember, our range in 8-bit is 0 to 255. So let's see if we can get a little bit more out of this. And 250 is generally where I like to go, because it gives you a little bit of wiggle room. However, if in case you just wanted to see, let's see what full dynamic range is at 255. And you see it's actually 5.3 stops up. But if you set your meter that way, you have no room for changes in light. So 250 is a better number to be at. The clipping point is a little warning that will show up on the bottom of the screen. We'll see this closer later. Let's change that to 245. The mid tone at 118 is good. And on the bottom, the dynamic range is set for 20. Well, all the way would be zero. Uh, we're not gonna use zero. Again, we'll, we'll go a little more conservative. We'll use 10. And our clipping point again, oh, let's set that at 20, oh, maybe even 15. And you can see now that our entire tonal range has changed. Now we see that this camera can see up four stops and down four and a half stops. So you go ahead and click on back, tell it to overwrite the file, and then we can load this newly edited exposure profile into the meter itself. We're gonna put it in slot two, click on two, click on the double arrow, and then come down where it says transfer to light meter. Click on there, and it will tell you, yes, we're gonna overwrite the camera default that's in there. It transfers the profile into the meter, and now the meter has all the information that it needs when we bring it out in the field to understand how our camera sees light. So we quit the software, and now we can go off and put it to use. So let's go through the procedure to capture our midtone, highlight, and shadow, and see how it shows up on the meter itself. So I take my incident reading, I get 1 100th 1 of a second at f11, so I put that in memory, and then I press the midtone button. Now that is recorded as my midtone. Now I need to find my highlights and my shadows. So I'm going to spin the IP style to the spot meter. And now I'm going to look for, oh, I've got some white clouds over here. Let me get a reading. And I'm getting, actually I'm getting 1 1250th of a second at my brightest white spot. So I'm going to put the memory button in for that. Now let me look for my shadow. And for a shadow reading, I got 1 15th of a second, so I'll put that in memory. So I've got my midtone, I have my highlight, my shadow. Now as I'm looking on here, you can see little indicators that are blinking. If they're blinking slowly, it does mean you're safe. And I can see that my highlight reading is right at the very edge of my clipping. My shadow reading is up a little bit. That means I have a little bit more room to move this exposure to save the highlights even a little bit more. So let me show you how to do that. So here we can see, that's my shadow reading that was the last one. What I want to do is I want to bring the mid-tone reading up again, and I do that by pressing in the mode button and then hitting mid-tone, and then you can see mid-tone flashing in the background.
So if you look at the bottom of the scale, you can see my highlight reading is right up against the far little indicator showing I'm at the edge of the exposure. And my shadow one has a little bit of leeway. Now the fact that they are both blinking slowly does mean that this exposure is okay. However, I'm gonna play it a little bit safer since I have a little more room on my shadow. I'm gonna adjust the exposure just a little bit. And I do that by holding in the mid-tone button. And I'm gonna adjust my exposure up a little bit just to bring everything into range a little bit better. All right, so now you can see at 1 160th of a second, now my highlight reading is below the clipping point and my shadow reading is above its clipping point. So everything is within range. Put this number into the camera, 1 60th at F11, 100 ISO, and you'll have the perfect exposure with your shadow safe and your highlight safe. So I'm in Zion National Park. This is the Overlook Trail. Just a little bit over here is a great panoramic opportunity looking down into the Zion Valley. However, the weather conditions are really interesting. It's storming, a little bit of rain. However, there's blue sky, there's puffy white clouds. It's all over the place. And this is the kind of scene that your camera really freaks out when it comes to metering. And this is where the Sekonic 758 meter can really come in, particularly when we're dealing with these panoramics. There's a feature in here that's going to let me average a whole bunch of readings so that I can find the best exposure for my panoramic. And you need to understand that's not always going to be the best looking image on the back of your camera. But it's really critical that we protect these white highlights. And I do have a white puffy cloud. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my meter on spot metering. I do that by spinning the eyepiece to the blue. And the first thing I'm going to do is figure out well, what aperture do I want. I'm going to start at f16 and see where that takes me. I'm also at 100 ISO. So I'm going to look through here, and I'm going to point at something that's kind of a mid-tone. I could pick some green foliage. That's usually pretty close to 18% gray, or some of these beige rocks. So I'm going to look through here, and I'm going to take a reading, and it's giving me a 40th of a second at f16. I'm going to hit the memory button to put that in, and that will show up on the bottom of my meter. The meter is showing me a scale that is how much tonal range my camera has. That kind of set my mid-tone. Now, what is the brightest thing I need to protect? Well, there's one puffy white cloud up there with a little bit of blue behind it. So I'm gonna look through there, hold in the measuring button until I get the biggest number, let go, and I get one 500th of a second at F16. Wonderful, so I put that in memory by hitting the button. Now, the other thing you need to look at is, what is the deepest shadow you need to record detail in? And that's an important consideration. I don't need to record detail in, say, a black hole in the ground. But what is the deepest bit, maybe the bark on a tree, that I need to record? So I'll just scan around and look for the smallest number. And as I love, just holding in the measure button, and the smallest number I get is a 15th of a second at f16. So I will put that in memory as well. Then I'll take a couple of other readings. Now that I've put these numbers in, when I look on the bottom of the display, and I'll show you this up closer, when I look on the bottom of the display, the right side from my mid-tone that I picked off the rock to that white cloud is blinking very fast. That means that that highlight at the setting I chose is going to clip. So I need to move that mid-tone number up. On the bottom of the display, there's two little points on either side of the display that show me the tone range of the camera. So in order to move all those numbers, I have to go through a little procedure. I hold in the mode button and hit mid-tone. That locks everything in place. Then I hold in the mid-tone button and rotate the jog wheel until the numbers all fall in my tonal range. Now nothing's flashing. It's just kind of gently flashing slowly. That's letting me know that it is very bright, but it's not clipping. When it flashes fast, that number's clipping. Slowly means you're getting to the edge, but you still have a little wiggle room. So I put this number in my camera shoot and forget. Forget about your camera's meter. It doesn't know what to do in this kind of situation. Trust this. So I've got my number for my panoramic. I'm ready to go. 
So let's take a look at one of the resulting images from our metering of this high contrast scene. And yeah, as you take a look at it, if you saw this with your eyes, you could see it would be very flat and there's a lot of detail loss, particularly in the highlights. And there's a lot of deep shadows, particularly in the foreground here. But take a look at this histogram. Look it up here in the upper right hand corner. It goes right up against the black. It goes almost right up against the white. This is about as good as you can expect to get. We have captured the entire tonal range of this scene. The problem is since our camera doesn't see the way our eyes do, it looks kind of flat. So we need to do a quick edit of this in Lightroom. So first of all, well, what's wrong? Well, the histogram is great. The exposure is good. We just need to shape the tones in the image. So let's bring those highlights way down. Let's start to do that. Let's open up the shadows. We'll add a little bit of contrast. We'll add a bunch of clarity here. Starting to look better already. We'll add some vibrance, which will increase the blues. We'll add a little bit more saturation to increase the warmth. So we're getting there. It's starting to look a little bit better, but the sky is still way too bright. So let's get the graduated filter and we're going to do just drag a graduation down here. We're going to darken the sky up a little bit more and we're going to add the dehaze filter to bring that out. And wow, what a difference already. We'll add a little clarity to it as well. That's looking good. So let's hit, uh, actually we're going to use the brush tool here. We're going to subtract out. Let's hit O to bring up the overlay and the mask so we can see where we are. And let's take out some of this here and I'm going to add it back in. In fact, we're going to come down into the canyon here a little bit so it can share in some of the clarity that we're adding to the sky. So this green area here is the area that's going to get our dehaze and clarity adjustments. All right, so let's turn that off and see how that looks. Looking better, we need to add a little bit more in here and a little bit in here. And yeah, that's looking a lot better. So let's hit done for that and let's do something similar for the foreground. Let's put a graduated filter there. Let's add a little bit more contrast, a little bit more brightness. We'll do that by actually increasing exposure a little bit and a little bit more saturation to the foreground. Let's add a little more contrast and let's see what dehaze does for the foreground. Actually, it makes us want to open up the shadows a bit more. So that quickly, even though this isn't the perfect lighting for this particular scene. So if I make a copy, I'll make a copy of this and I'll reset it. And when we compare these two, when we turn off the uh, lights in Lightroom here, you can see before and after, left to right, what was actually in the scene. We were able to capture the entire dynamic range of this scene in a single shot because the meter told us exactly how bright we could put the highlights and how we could adjust the exposure up and down to be able to capture all the details in the shadows as well. In fact, if we come in here, let's, let's go down into these shadows, and you'll see that we did a great job of capturing detail right up against the foreground. Let's let this finish drawing in. All right, so you can see the foreground. We've got detail in the deepest shadows. And as we scroll up to the top, you'll see we've got our cloud detail in the brightest spots of the cloud. So let's back out of that. Let me show you the resulting panoramic stitch of the shots that were combined to this. Now, here's another thing where you want, when you're, when you're shooting landscapes and you're doing panoramics and you have a really variable kind of weather going on like this, it pays to hang around and wait because not too long after this, the sun started to break out. It lit up the foreground and we ended up with a beautiful shot. And again, the meter told us where to put this perfect exposure to make this happen in a single exposure. So I hope you can see what an incredibly useful tool the Sekonic 758DR meter is. It really eliminates the guessing, gives you all the information you need for that perfect exposure. You might have that once in a lifetime trip, that once in a lifetime atmosphere and light. 
This will allow you to capture it every time. Combined with the Color Checker Passport, you can then load the information into the meter that tells the meter exactly how your camera sees light, what middle gray is, and how much tonal range it has. When you have that information, the meter will tell you exactly when you have the perfect shot. So that's it for today. Thanks for watching. I hope you found some information you can use, and I hope to see you online again soon. Until next time, be well and keep shooting.